Hello and welcome to The Solidarity Show, your weekly show where we bring you all that's new in union news and my gosh, it's been a big week. So Liam, my co-host, Assistant Secretary of the ACTU, how are you going this evening? I'm good, Emma. How are you? Episode seven. Seven. Here we go. I'd like to start by acknowledging traditional owners on the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. This is a very important week, Reconciliation Week and the anniversary of the referendum. And we have got a big show indeed tonight, Emma. We've got a few guests here, including an international flavour. We've got some guests, some comrades from India who are going to tell us about the COVID experience in India and what they're going through. We've got some great representatives from the UW, in particular Hospo Voice, who are going to talk about how they're preparing their industry um, to, to reopen in many states in this country, but in particular here in Melbourne and, and some of the plans they've got to make their workplaces COVID safe. We've got the regular Francis Leach, who's going to tell us all about books, culture, all the things that are, that are really important at this time of the pandemic. But most importantly, we've got up next the Secretary of the ACTU, Sally McManus. So it's, it's going to be a big show and I'm hoping Sally's here with us now to give us an update on what's been going on. Hey, Sally. Hey, Liam. How are you going? Good, good. Here from like the Rebel base. Yes, I am um, broadcasting direct from the Rebel Alliance headquarters, as you can see. We've got a few questions here that we just want to get into as well. So we might just keep a few more minutes of your time and because I think they do sort of largely relate to some of the things we've talked about. And along with the Prime Minister's speech this week, we also saw a decision handed down uh, last week, actually, which we talked briefly about on the show, but obviously it's gotten a lot of attention. And Wayne asks a question around... Uh, the decision around casuals and, and and with the recent court decision, how long does a casual worker have to do the same type of work before they can become a permanent? And what do they have to do to apply to transfer from a casual to a permanent? Well, um, first of all, a whole lot of awards and you should check yourself already have a casual conversion clause in them. There's some weaknesses with it and they kick in after 12 months, but you've got to have been working a regular pattern of work um, that could, you know, continue as a full-time or a part-time job as well. Um, and you've got a right to request uh, a conversion, but as we all know, that's a tough thing because often uh, employers will, you know, know if you're a casual and you request something, they won't say that's the reason why they're let letting you go. So first of all, there is that right. Second of all, the um, court decision, basically it reaffirmed what the common law, so what, what, the law has been saying for a long time that if you have regular ongoing work and you know in, in advance that you're going to have all this regular ongoing work, well, you're really not a casual, even if the boss puts a label on you saying you're a casual. And for a while in our country, essentially what's happened is, you know, the employers have created a whole category and they just made it up called permanent casuals. Mm -hmm. No such thing as permanent casuals. It's permanent jobs with rights and there's casual jobs which aren't ongoing and they're not um, regular. So the decision itself doesn't put like a strict time limit saying at this point, you've got a right to, to, to go over, but you may have it in your uh, award and you may have a right in a common law. Um, so that's, remember this case was in the federal court. You had to go off to the court to fight it um, to be converted um, uh, into permanent work. That's a really good point, Sally. I mean, this is nothing new, this case. It's been, it's been the case for a long time. Our next question is from Ivan, who works in the railways, and he wants to ask about social distancing. And he essentially says, you know, for his work, it's very hard to do social distancing. They often require, you know, two people to do the work. It's very heavy work. And it's confusing about what the requirements are, and everything just gets thrown out the door um, when it comes to work. What do we uh, do at work about things like social distancing, and how do we make sure that we can do it and get the work done? Yeah, okay, Liam. So, um, and to Ivan, well, first of all, you've got to remember that your employer has an obligation to do, you know, whatever is reasonable to make um, you safe at work. And in the case of the coronavirus, we know that one of the most important things is social distancing. If you are distant from someone, you aren't going to catch a very small chance of catching the virus or, or none if you're properly distant. So, first of all, that should be the first basis, if work can be done without and imp implement um, social distancing, that's what needs to happen. If some jobs, there's, it's just not possible. It's a nature of the work that you have to be in close contact um, with people. Um, if that's the case, well, your employer should do everything they possibly can to um, minimize um, that risk. And so 
that will be PPE, that will be obviously, you know, proper sanitation and hygiene and all of those things. So um, if physical distancing isn't possible, um, that should be done. If it's a case that um, in your job that usually like to help each other out, you wouldn't be social distancing. Well, it's not usual time. It's not usual time now. And that really things do need to change in workplaces to make sure that we're not spreading the virus because we don't want to see a second wave. Um, that would be devastating, obviously, for health reasons, but also if we had to go back um, to all the restrictions just for jobs, for all our jobs. So I would highly encourage all of you to go to the ACTU website and there is a COVID-19 aware toolkit, which has actually just been launched and it's really fantastic. It's got everything you would need as a worker or as a health and safety rep, where you basically got a whole checklist um, for your workplace and a whole toolkit about um, what you need to do to make um, your workplace as safe as possible um, in the time of um, a pandemic. Excellent. And we are going to give everyone the details in the chat a little bit later about the COVID aware campaign that kicks off tomorrow. So thank you, Sally. One more final question, which will be Mitchell's question. And he's anxious about going back on public transport and he's being told that he has to start coming back to work. And is there anything that he can do? And what about asking his employer to give him a mask or something like that? What advice do we have for Mitchell? Well, uh, again, I go back to those principles we were talking before, like your employer uh, is still responsible for your health and if they're saying you need to come to work and your work can't happen from home well then you can negotiate things you should try and negotiate things that will limit your exposure coming to and from work so first of all if your work can be done from home um, and there's an issue in terms of not being able to get to work say you don't have your own car or you can't travel in in non-peak times well then they should be facilitating work from home um, secondly, um, if you do have to come to work because it's the nature of it, some of the things that union members are negotiating all over the place is things like staggered shifts. So it might be that um, people start uh, are later so that they, um, you know, that public transport's not as full basically. So these are things that should be negotiated in a strong union workplace. Um, so to keep, keep you safe and that you've got that plan there that everyone knows and has agreed to. Excellent, Sally. Well, thank you again for coming on and, and, and sharing with us what's been going on this week and answering some questions. Um, all the best. May the force be with you, comrade. Um, keep up the and good work and, and we'll see you in the next couple of weeks. Okay. See ya. Thanks. Sally. Thanks again, Sally. And um, now, Liam, we have uh, the United Workers Union Dream Team in Jules and Jess from the Hos from Hospo Voice who are going to take us through um, what Hospital Voice is, what are they doing, and um, everything that we need to know from workers on the front line in hospitality. So Jules is a chef um, and a Hospital Voice member and is currently part of, uh, part of the Hospital Voice member organiser program. And we have Jess, who is a former chef and currently the digital organiser for Hospital Voice. So Jess, can you just first take us through what is Hospital Voice for our comrades watching who might not be aware of the work that you do? Sure, so we're a, uh, the hospitality union based in Victoria um, and we are a digital union. So we do heaps of work online, um, reaching out to workers lately all over the country because everything's online anyway. So why not talk to hospital workers wherever you are? Um, and we've been, um, we've been fighting really hard. We're quite young, a couple of years old, but we've been fighting really hard over the last couple of years um, over wage theft, which is a huge problem in the industry. And lately uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been bringing workers together to you know, support each other and, um, and get through this sort of difficult time together and uh, make sure that we're staying safe when we do have to go back to work. Thanks so much for that, Jess. And for you, Jules, um, how did you get involved in the Hospital Voice and um, what has been your highlight so far being active in your union? Um, so I got into Hospital Voice uh, uh, probably the last uh, year um, and it, it stemmed from wage theft. Um, and uh, so basically uh, I've been in the industry for 15 years. I have uh, had my wages stolen in practically every job that I've worked for. Um, so I had to draw the line. I'm 34 and I'm too old. 
to be stolen from. Uh, and it made me realize that uh, I had to do something. So um, I was seeing how much traction Hospital Voice was getting in our community. And I thought, well, I need to unionize with my workers um, at my um, restaurant. And uh, just having those guys in the background, our union was enough to give enough sway and influence to uh, negotiate with our employers. And um, I got about 15K back, um, which was absolutely life-changing. Um, so now um, I just want that for everybody else who's ever been in our industry. It's not fair, it's not good enough. Um, I've seen so many people exploited in my experience and I don't wanna leave this industry knowing that there are people and workers being exploited. So uh, it's, it's unfortunately a very common story we hear often in particular in your industry, Jules, and obviously, you know, your union has been doing great work in terms of not just winning um, back pay for workers like you, but exposing what's been going on. Obviously, all of this sort of came a bit to a sort of a, a crushing halt in many respects with the onset of COVID. How has COVID sort of impacted you personally as a worker and, and also some of your colleagues as well? Um, for me, I was pretty lucky, but that's largely because my boss uh, that I got the back pay for obviously knew that uh, it, they weren't in a position to really um, manipulate anything. So I was put on JobKeeper. Um, and that has been fantastic because it's meant that I've had some uh, income uh, whilst I've actually moved down to look after my parents who, who are elderly, they are in their 70s, and I'm the only uh, child who has the capabilities to look after them. Um, so for me, it was a massive uh, quick move down there. Um, and, uh, yeah, and my partner had to move down with me. So, I mean, our income is fairly limited because he had to um, resign from his job. Uh, to be with me. Um, so uh, we're, you know, so safe and healthy, which is great. But at the same time, uh, I've been using this time to really reach out to other workers. And the, the information that I'm getting from a lot of people in our industry are that they are being exploited even under JobKeeper, um, which is absolutely um, shocking that you would think that even in a pandemic, that people would actually step up and be better people during this time and realize what's important. And yet that's not happened. Yeah. There's people in our industry all over the state who are not getting paid while they have sick leave, even though they have doctor certificates. So they're getting even less than the 750. We're getting people who are working over 38 hours and only getting paid the 750, even though they should be getting about a thousand. So, for me, like during this time, we're trying to do everything in our power to just understand the way in which everybody is being affected by this COVID and seeing the sort of cynical, like the sinister sort of attitudes and aspects of our um, employers and what they're doing with JobKeeper and, and other people who just don't qualify as well. Yeah, thanks, Jules. I mean, obviously, like we, we've heard, um, Jess, a lot of unions have had similar experiences, but has, has what Jules described um, in terms of her colleagues also been something that you at Hospo Voice have been seeing a lot of in terms of the types of um, complaints that people are bringing to you? Yeah, absolutely. And also like really dodgy cashback schemes. So um, workers being directed to give money back to their employer from their JobKeeper payment um workers doing like all sorts of things that are way outside their job descriptions like sure you know most people in hospitality are you know used to doing a bit of cleaning at work and things of that nature but you know we're hearing about people who are being directed to do like sort of construction work with no training um or someone told me they were like tutoring their their boss's children um so yeah a lot of um a lot of bosses are really sort of i guess taking it too far trying to use this as a, a way to get as much as they can out of people um which is unfortunately um sort of the sort of exploitation we're really used to seeing in the industry and that we're you know fighting against yeah. completely outrageous dodgy practices right and yeah. Now we're facing a position where we know that um, workers are going to be returning to work as well. Um, we've got um, the reopening of cafes, restaurants and pubs. And I'm just thinking about 
you know, ensuring um, workers in the hospo industry, their health and safety? Like, what are your thoughts on um, how hospital workers are feeling about um, their work health and safety when these other dodgy practices are already happening as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a really... You go, Jules. <laughs> This is the challenge about multiple panellists there, Molly. Can't stop them from talking over each other. I'll chair the meeting. Jules followed by Jess. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this social distancing can't occur um, in, in a lot of kitchens. Uh, uh, most kitchens are really, really tiny and uh, it's hot in there. And, you know, these practices are really hard to observe on a on on busy ships, let alone in a pandemic. Um, so uh, yeah, there's social distancing. There's issues of um, how many patrons are coming in. Um, employers obviously looking to uh, regain some of um, the losses that they've made over this time. So the temptation is there to um, fill those uh, venues up, uh, you know, as legally as they can, I guess, perhaps. Um, we're also like protective equipment, um, training in regards to what should be observed. I mean, the other day I was watching a news program where an owner was talking about how they're doing all these practices um, to observe in social distancing during the pandemic. And literally the camera panned over to her shoulder to shoulder next to the barista. So, I mean, how are workers protected against other workers in that situation? Um, it's really a, a, a major concern for us. Mm. And Jess, obviously you're, the Hospo Voices has, has come out with some, you know, sort of COVID, COVID aware, COVID safe plans for reopening. How has that been received by members and in particular the industry? Yeah, look, I think you know, a lot of people are really keen to get back to work, of course. So, um, but wanting to stay safe while they're at it. So I think workers are, I think, quite nervous that their employers aren't going to have their um, have their best interests at heart all of the time, especially when we, you know, know there's so much non-compliance in the industry um, in other respects. But um, but also, I think that um, you know, so many more people have. I've been getting involved lately and reaching out to us and getting getting together in their union and it's meant that a lot more workers are like ready to sort of speak out and make sure that the right things are happening at work. So that that's good to see and you know we're ready to have each other's backs. So that's good. Congratulations for the huge work the two of you are doing in building your union and building a strong, powerful voice for hospital workers. And thanks so much for joining us tonight and joining and giving insights into the hospital industry to not only a big, big crowd in this evening watching um, here through Zoom, but also the hundreds of people who are watching via Facebook as well. So thanks very much and have a great night. All the best. Thanks, thanks Jess. Much. Thanks, Jules. Yeah, just really, really disturbing stuff, Emma. And, you know, it's definitely got a lot of people talking in the chat. It's been great to see people talking in the chat about everything from Sally's discussion right through to um, what's going on here, and in particular, the health and safety issues that HOSPO workers have faced throughout this pandemic. But in particular, you know, even in this, in this state, as, as hospitality starts to open up, just as we've said before, you know, our public health measures have really been focused about keeping the public out of businesses um, and keeping them at a distance. As we know, uh, work health and safety laws haven't been being complied with when it comes to workplaces and keeping people physically distanced, let alone the other controls. Exactly. So next, um, our next guests are um, some international guests, as I indicated at the start. We've got um, Giotti and, um, and a comrade of hers from uh, India. And we've also got um, Claire Middlemass, uh, international officer who is going to interview our comrades. So welcome, Claire. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, my name is Claire Middlemass. I'm the ACTU's international officer and I'm really honoured to be here tonight to chat with our international guests. As unionists, we know just how important international solidarity is and I think this crisis has shown now more than ever how important it is. Unfortunately, many governments around the world are using the COVID-19 crisis as a cover to roll back workers' rights and introduce authoritarian measures. 
but workers around the world are fighting back and finding new ways to organise despite the restrictions we're all facing. So we're very fortunate tonight to be joined by two amazing women unionists from India leading the fight. We've got Jyoti Makwan and Manali Shah from the CY Union, the Self-Employed Women's Association. And they're going to tell us more about the impact of coronavirus on their workers, the government's response, and how unions are organising. So thank you and welcome Jyoti and Manali. We really appreciate you, appreciate your time. Thanks. Oh, great, Jyoti, you're on fantastic. So I'll, I'll first start um, by asking you, Jyoti, can you tell us a little bit about your union and the workers you represent? Sure. I think SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, is a trade union of women workers in the informal economy of our country. We have been organising this women workers since almost last 48 years now. And we are organizing them with their collective strength. We wanted to achieve full employment and make these women workers self-aligned. So those are the two major objectives of our union. And we have been organizing these workers uh, around 18 states of our country, India. And we have a total membership of 2 million women workers who are in our union. It's fantastic. And what are the challenges your members are facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic? I think the biggest challenge what we see when it comes to the informal economy workers, which constitute 93% of our labor workforce in our country, and the biggest challenge is livelihoods. So we, we say it to be an economic health, and when it comes to livelihoods, we really would like to see that the workers are facing work security because they have no work now income security, which is very important. So now they do not have access to work security and income security. And I think that is the biggest challenge. And because they don't have work and income, the, the other biggest challenge is the food security. None of these workers' family has access to enough two-time meals in their family. So I think the food security is also a biggest challenge here. How do you access two-time meals in this condition to these families? And I think the third is uh, the full, I think the, the social security, we call it to be a physical health. We wanted to see how the physical health goes together with the economic health. And the, uh, the third is more on mental health because every, each of these workers have no work, no income, no food, and they are in the, in the home with their families and children. And I think a mental health is also a biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, for the workers in formal economy and, and, and our members. Absolutely. And so what has CEWA been doing to overcome these challenges? I think uh, one the, we started with creating more awareness of taking precaution during this condition because these workers stay very in a very slum areas in the urban urban and also in the villages they store very, they stay very close by. So I think creating an awareness that what is this Corona COVID-19 and what are the precautions you have to take, that was the biggest action what we had to do. But since we were not able to reach them personally, we had created our own app through the technology, reaching them through Zoom and the, the other apps. So we could make uh, posters and pictures and messages, voice messages, so they, they can learn on what precaution they had to take care of. So I think that in that we invested a lot in the initial days. Mm -hmm. Then secondly, when it comes to the food part, because that was the major thing. So as soon as the government were declaring some of these schemes, we were linking them with accessing the food grains from the government schemes, the packages which they were declaring. So I think we, our uh, community, our leaders in the ground, had worked hard. And though this was too much in terms of getting unsecured, but I think both in the rural areas and the urban areas, our leaders, our union leaders had worked very hard to be with the members on the ground with, of course, all safety and precaution, but to reach to the members that at least they have enough two time meal. So I think that was the second after creating awareness we had to work on. And I think third more now we were working on how do we create more livelihood opportunities for these 
to work with. So I think in the initial stage and even now, our women, we have trained them to make masks and we are marketing those masks both in rural and urban areas in full of, in all the states where we are organizing the women workers. Secondly, in the rural as we all work towards, because we are organizing small and marginal farmers and agriculture workers. So how do we really uh, help them to in their resources? Bidhi rural and so in the so we already have uh, a key of rural and consumers where the coordinates from small rural farmers and we have been taking more this produce to all the units. So I we force activity to go in this so that we have the food. And then the thirdly, at least especially in the urban areas, was in the in urban area, I think uh, that will cut to more of our zones are in tenement zone and then cut so but the essential services and vegetables and meat had reached all the families. So I think we've organized more than 50,000 uh, street and vegetables in the city of Amba. And we had lived them with the government in the Bangalore. They had us, where three days were supplying the vegetables and milk to the Karyu area. And so we had link our vendors to do to go on eat us and sell the vegetable and milk and start working. Sorry, Jati. I think we're having a bit of Sorry. problem with Jati. Sorry, Jati. Um, like <laughs> Sorry, we had a little bit of a sound issue at the end there with you, Jati, but we, we caught every everything else you said except for the last 30 seconds so uh but thank you very much Claire, that people understand as well in particular jody can't access um work internet because of the lockdowns in india so she's just she's using her mobile phone so it is very difficult so exactly yeah thank you jody for that um, thank you very much and look i'll i'll turn to manali now and see uh if you're there and if you can turn on your camera manali that would be great i hope we've got a stable connection here with you No, Manali? Uh, are you able to? Yeah. I think if I use the yes. camera, then there will be a problem of uh, the internet. So if I can speak, uh, if I can use only the audio, that would be great. Absolutely. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Well, um, I wanted to ask you, Manali, about the um, nationwide day of action that Indian unions called on Friday. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what that protest was about? Yeah, sure. The joint platform of center trade, all central trade unions took note of this critical situation of the workers uh, in the country and decided to launch one day protest on 22nd May, that is uh, Friday. And the protest was regarding the facts that government keeps on changing its one or other direction that affects the workers of the country who are already in deep distress and miseries in the midst of the lockdown. I think Jyoti Ben just shared the plight of the informal workers. And, uh, and even in this uh, uh, condition, the government wants to dilute the labor laws. All the labor laws in India are central, but the state government makes the changes, which is really unconstitutional and changes will uh, severely affect the health, safety, and the well-being of the workers. So just I, I would like to share that uh, in more than 15 states, the working hours of the workers are extended from eight hours a day to 12 hours without overtime and suspension of all labor laws for 1,000 to 1,200 days. In one of the state that is Uttar Pradesh, the labor laws were suspended for three years, which was challenged in the high court and, and, uh, and due to the high court orders, it was later withdrawn. So that's why we had a nationwide wide, uh, strike on, on, on 22nd of the May. 
And can you tell us a little bit more about what the day itself was like? Uh, was, a, was it a success? Um, did a lot of CWA members mobilise? And what was a protest under social distancing like? Oh, it was, a, it was really a big success. And the protest was conducted in all the states. And the workers participated uh, in a... Uh, the workers participated and uh, it was it was like a hunger a hunger strike and the central trade union leaders uh, gave the memorandum to the prime minister not to the prime minister but uh, addressed to the prime minister because uh, they were sitting in the uh, uh, capital of Delhi and uh, they were protesting there but the police didn't allow them to go on the strike. And then they were took to the, took them, then the police took them to the police station and then later released. But then the all central trade unions give the, the leaders give the memorandum addressed to the prime minister to the head of the police station. And all the media took the notice of it and gave the prime coverage. So, and also similarly, all central trade unions have wrote to the ILO regarding the suspension of labor laws and ILO assured us that it will take up the matter and it will take up the matter with the Prime Minister of India. Mm. Well unfortunately that's all we have time for tonight but I, I really want to thank you both Jyoti and Manali for joining us. It's so important for us to hear about your struggles and really a lot of the things you spoke about are the same issues Australian workers are facing here and um, so, and we've had a number of messages come through the chat, um, sending messages of solidarity and saying how inspiring it is to hear from you. So I just want you to know that we appreciate it and that the Australian Mo Union Movement stands with you in solidarity. Thanks very much. And so back to you. you. Well said. And, and thank, thank you. you to Giorgia and Manali and, and, and to all of your comrades for the great work that you're doing in standing up for your brothers and sisters over there. And, some pretty hard times, I've got to say, Emma. Um, you know, we've seen around the world authoritarian regimes really, you know, flex their muscle through this pandemic. And um, we're going to hopefully bring some more stories each week, um, in particular from around our region, so that everybody gets a sense of what's going on out there. Because, you know, more than ever, we are, you know, whilst isolated, connected. And, and the principle behind this solidarity show is to bring people together. And we really want to make sure that we do that. Um, but speaking of bringing people together, and he, and he jumped on just there, um, our next guest um, is our regular for the show, our cultural icon, um, Francis Leach. Welcome, Francis. Good evening, Liam. Hi, Emma. Hello, comrades. How are we all? We are good, Francis. Now, what is the first big tip? What do we need to be getting around this week, Francis? Well, it is uh, Reconciliation Week, as we know, and I'd like to pay uh, my respects to uh, the elders past and present and, uh, and future on the, for, on the land in which I'm on tonight, here in Wurundjeri people, uh, and, and to, to introduce you to something that is very much part of Australia's Indigenous history that was on ABC TV on Sunday night, and it is on ABC, that wonderful free platform, ABC iView, for you to watch at your leisure. It's a documentary uh, called, uh, uh, called Maralinga Juratura, which is the history of the connection, the 60,000 year old connection of the Maralinga people to their land, the land that was used between 1953 and 1963 for the British nuclear tests. Uh, the people who lived and roamed that land for, uh, for decades, for centuries, for, for millennia, were moved off the land into other camps and away from their country. And this is a beautifully made documentary by uh, an outfit called Blackfella Films who have made numerous documentaries uh, about Indigenous history and Indigenous, Indigenous culture in this country, about their experience and about the return of that land to the Maralinga people in the 80s and the 90s. And it's, uh, it's beautifully shot. It, uh, it is done very much in the voice of the people themselves. And it's a part of Australia's history that we kind of know a little bit about because, you know, it was such a, a big part of Australia's Cold War experience, the British nuclear tests. But this takes us to a place that's a perspective from the Indigenous people that lived through it and how they've managed a strong people, a strong culture to actually maintain their links to the land, 
maintain their links to ceremony, maintain their links to country and language. And it's a really inspiring story. So I suggest you take, check it out. It's ABC iView. Maralinga Geratura is the name of the film. Blackfellow Films, uh, the, the brilliant filmmakers that they are, an hour-long documentary that will give you a really special insight into a long struggle. And as unionists, we know all about struggle, but also, in a sense, the triumph of the community that wasn't prepared to be told that it couldn't go back to its own country. It's a great film, really worth watching. Excellent, Francis. And what else is there we should be getting around and watching or reading? Watching and listening to, Liam. There's, uh, as you know, as live music fans, we're really struggling at the moment. There is no chance or no prospect anytime soon that we will be able to go and see our favourite bands play. So musicians are trying to be a bit innovative and, and governments and other institutions are starting to join the party. So the state of Victoria have put together a program called the State of Music. And I might actually, I'm going to just right now put in the chat uh, the link to the uh, Marilinga story, but I'm also going to just chuck into the chat there a link to the State of Music, which is a, a really interesting idea by the state of Victoria to try to give uh, working musicians a weekly opportunity to perform live online. And they're doing it again this week, Friday the 22nd of May. You don't have to be Victorian to, to watch the show, but it features the Rubens, uh, something for Kate and a bunch of other artists on Friday night. Uh, and you, get, you can just tune in on Facebook or on, on, on YouTube and watch the performance. I've just put the link in the chat room there so you can see it. And there's also another one that's been uh, done by James Rain called uh, Red Hot Sundays. Uh, he's doing uh, a stream as well. If you just search Red Hot Sundays on Facebook, uh, he'll be performing Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m for a, a donation for other musicians who are doing it tough. We know that musicians have been left out of JobKeeper and, uh, you know, the music industry has stopped stone dead in its tracks at the moment. So check out the links I've put in the chat there. State of, uh, state of play uh, from the Victorian uh, government. Each Friday night they're putting on a big gig with lots of different performers and uh, that's nothing to, it doesn't cost you anything to watch and, uh, you know, get an opportunity to support musicians who uh, have been, you know, really hit hard by the COVID-19 shutdown and the pandemic, guys. So there's a couple of things to enjoy over the next seven days. Well, that's Excellent, Francis. Happens. Something, to, something to, to, to watch, something to listen to. And what we should turn our minds to, Francis, given that footy's back in a couple of weeks, they tell me that the NRL is going to start playing soon. We should start turning our mind to sport. Emma would love to talk about the Bombers. We should Absolutely. Let it go once. Uh, we're all missing so, our teams at the moment, aren't yeah, we? we hook something up for a future show. Get, get, some, get, get some sport going. Oh, thanks, Francis. See you guys. Thanks, Francis. And for viewers at home, just so you know, every week Liam goes, can we talk about sport yet? Can we <laughs> talk about sport yet? <laughs> it's getting very close. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> what do we got next, Emma? Last uh, well, last COVID segment. aware, Liam, COVID aware. So this That's is right. the part of the show. It's a union meeting after all um, where we haven't asked. So COVID aware is the next phase in the campaign, isn't it, Liam? Can you just give us a quick... It is, uh, and, and Sally alluded to it at the start. Tomorrow, we will be sending an email out, but I'm going to give everyone a sneak peek in the chat. I'm hoping Dr Byrne will put something up very, very shortly. If he doesn't, I will sneak something there at the very end, which is called um, COVID Aware. This is a um, online resource. It includes a checklist that you can take online. It'll reveal to you what the gaps are in your workplace, mm -hmm and start guiding you through a COVID aware kit that essentially spells out for you what, what you can do to sort of make things better in your workplace around, whether it be physical distancing, cleaning and hygiene, even how you get to and from work. And this is really important because it's actually for union members only. So we have put this behind for all intents and purposes of union paywall, and we'll be putting it out there in the community and hopefully, you know, raising awareness to people about the really important work that unions do. So we're going to encourage people to start sharing that from tomorrow. As I said, you'll get an email from Sally in the morning, uh, letting you know, and you'll see a lot of this stuff on, on Facebook and other social media. So that's the really big push for the next few days. And we're really keen to get as many people using uh, that checklist so that we can understand also what the experience of Australian workers is as they start to increase their economic activity and heading back into work. So that's the, that's the key ask for this week, Emma. Absolutely. And look, comrades, all I can say is it's unreal, right? Like I really like organising. These tools are incredible. It gives you a workplace assessment. It gives you all the fact sheets once you've made an assessment and identified gaps in any workplace. Um, so really take a look at it and share it, share it, share it on platforms because we want to um, put power in workers' hands um, during this really uncertain time. 
So we've got something special to finish off with this evening, Liam. We do, we do. And I want to preview what we're going to do next week because um, it was released this morning. Obviously, the Sydney Film Festival is on. You can't go and watch uh, the films like you have in the past, but from week after next, you'll be able to, well, actually, you can buy tickets now, but you'll be able to watch these films online. And there's a really important story that we're going to bring you a bit more information on next week. But it's, it's about a documentary titled Women, Women in Steel. And this is a really important story about some women in Wollongong who had decided many years ago, back in the 60s and 70s, that it was not right that there were not women being employed in the Port Kembla Steelworks. And they took a stand and they, with their unions, organised to make sure that women were employed in that steel mill. And we want to bring you some more about that, but we're going to show you the trailer tonight and um, encourage people to go out and get tickets. Tickets are available from today, but we're also going to have a bit of a longer form interview next week, hopefully with the producers of the show and some of the women who are involved in that campaign. So I'm going to hand it over to our uh, other Liam, Dr. Liam, uh, our historian, who's going to intro the video and leave us with that. A lot of these jobs in BHP surely would be very difficult grimy, noisy, dirty jobs. I mean, do women in Port Kembla or Wollongong want these jobs? Tents, banners and petitions presented an unfamiliar sight to steel workers at Australian Iron and Steel today. The group is planning to file the first class action suit Australia has ever seen against the steelworks company. It's a crazy, you're not going to beat BHP. Are you one of those women in the tents? Well, one I nearly threw off the bridge because he was being very cheeky. When I looked at the paper, job for women. Women especially, they are good fighters. No, 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 wrong. They say people waiting long time, how many years? But all these people have got the same type of face. I'm sure if you went in among the half of them wouldn't know how to speak English. We organised. We marched. And I want a job and I want a work. I have family. We went to court. The company spent up big. BHP delayed and stalled. One judge has referred to it as being as significant as the basic wage case. If people get together, we can be strong. You can achieve a lot. If it takes another 13 years, we'll be here. 